All right, hi you all. I hope you all are doing well. So this is the lecture for first of July. Lecture one for Wednesday, first of July. So this last slide might ring a bell. We kind of touched upon the enthalpy chain. of a solution and how to find it, right? And we said that's a sum of delta H1, delta H2, and delta H3. And the way we had defined delta H1 was how the solvent particles broke down, right? And the energy associated with that was delta H1, and delta H2 was the energy associated with solid particle breaking down right our solid particle breaking down that was our h2 and finally when these broken down or solid particles come along with broken down or separated solid particles and their interaction to form this we had defined that as delta h3 or the enthalpy change oscillated with the solid solvent interaction. And finally, the delta H solution can be found by adding those three, H delta H1, delta H2, and delta H3. And after that, I ended the class with this figure, and I told you entropy is something that we're going to cover uh, probably in the last week of the semester, or towards the last week of the semester. Uh, and what I had said was entropy is defined as the degree of disorderedness in a substance, right? So that's called entropy. And that's why easy way to think about this, right? We think about solid, liquid, and gas. And in one of the earlier slides, we had said that gas is the most disordered one, right? Because molecules are much more apart, they have more spaces to move about, that's why most disordered, whereas solid is the least disordered. So solid is the least disordered. So if I ask you which one has the highest entropy among solid, liquid, and gas, if it's the same substance, you cannot compare apples and oranges, right? So let's see if I'm talking about solid ice versus liquid water versus vapor water. You're going to tell me that vapor water has the highest entropy because it is the most disordered among those three. All right, so now moving on, we're going to start talking about some of the units that we use in chemistry or the concentration of solutions. All right, so again, this is something we have, we had already talked about in game 115, right? At least the moles per liter or molarity is something that you are used to. All right. So molarity, mole fraction, and molality are the ones that we'll focus on in and 11. Others, make sure you know probably how to use them, but then those two are the ones that I'm gonna focus on a lot because all the formulas that we're gonna use uses those units of concentration. All right, so again, the concentration of, whenever you think about solution, again, think about, let's see, have a beaker, I have water, and let's see if I dissolve some salt in it, right? Then my salt, or my solute, if you want to call it, the green dust that I'm sowing. So how much solute is dissolved in that solvent, right? That's what concentration tells us. But there are various units, so let's start with the first unit. All right, so the first unit is called molarity. So this is more like a revision for you. So molarity equals to moles, number of moles of solute 
that is in a given volume of solution. But that given volume has to be in liters. That's why the unit for molarity is moles per liter. All right, so let's do a problem based on that as to how we can use that. So this is directly from Alex. You've been given 12 grams of methanol. Is dissolved in a solvent, which they do not specify, but the amount of solvent is 300 milliliters. So they're asking me to figure out molarity. So first, I'm going to write out my formula molarity. Right, so number of moles of solute, so whatever you're dissolving in the solvent, divided by the volume of solution. But so this number, sorry, I forgot to write on moles here. Right, but the unit has to be liters. That is really, really important, right? So I use that formula. Now let's start with the first one. Let's figure out first the number of moles of the solid. And since they dissolve 12 gram of methanol, you have been given the mass of methanol, right? So let's do it here. 12 grams. of methanol times to convert mass to methanol i use the molar mass of methanol right so if i the atomic mass of all of these atoms it will give me the molar mass making sure that i take care of these three hydrogens as well right it will give me the molar mass of methanol which is equals to 32.04 gram of methanol are present in one mole of methanol right if i do that cancel out the gram of methanol gram of methanol and i just convert the mass of the methanol to moles of methanol right so my mass sorry number of moles is going to be 0 0.3745 moles all right, so let me just double check my math really quick. I think it's been a while I double checked my notes. So 12 grams divided by 32.04 will give me three cells. All right, perfect. All right, so now I found my number of moles of solute. Now let me find the volume of solution, right? So uh, it was dissolved in 300 milliliters of the solvent. The next thing that I want to do is, but then do you see how this volume has to be in liters? So I'm going to take that 300 milliliters. Use my conversion factor that I know there are 1,000 milliliters in one liter. When I do that, guess what? The milliliter and milliliter cancels out, and I just changed the volume. Now, something that you should have noticed, right, is basically to make sure that I align my answer to correct number of sig fix, 300 ml, I made sure that I wrote 0 0.300 liters, All right? Because remember, in the end, you have to make sure you report your answer to the correct number of sig fix, right? So my molarity is going to be number of moles. So whenever I solve for number of moles, keep this in mind, right? I have to you put my answer to two sig figs. So I'm just going to kind of keep that in mind. I'm going to write the whole answer out for number of moles, but then I'm going to keep that two more number, two sig figs in mind for this 12 gram, right? So 0 0.3745 moles headed by 0 0.300 liters. So again, this is seven right here. Right. So again, remember, 
I'm supposed to report this to only two six figs. All right. So now, whenever I divide those two numbers, 0 0.3745 divided by 0 0.300, what I get is 1.248. But since this was supposed to have three six figs, this was supposed to have two six figs, and my rule for division tells me that the one with the least number of sig figs dictates how many sig figs should I have in my final answer. And that's why my final answer is going to be two sig figs. That's why 1.2 molarity or 1.2 moles per liter is my final answer for molarity. So I hope this makes sense. Again, this is more like a review for you from uh, KM 115. All right, so but make sure you take a stab at it, all right, without looking up. If you're comfortable, at least do not look at how I have worked out. See if you can solve it out in a plain piece of paper without looking at my work. All right now, the next one, molality. All right, so I'm going to erase this board. I can just work out everything here. It's all in one slide. All right, first, I'm going to again write down molality formula. So my molality formula tells me that Molality equals to moles of solute carried by Kz of solvent And uh, after I solve this molality, I'm, I will kind of talk about this as to what this question means over here, all right? But let's solve for molality really quick. So again, where did I get the formula from? Right here, molality is most of solute per kg of solvent. That's what the unit is going to have is number of moles per kg, all right? So first, let's find the number of moles of solid. Good thing is I already did that, right? Because my program of methanol, so my number of moles of solute, right? I'm just gonna use an N for methanol was something that I already calculated for my molarity solve. So that was number was 0 0.3745. Now I have to figure out the kg of solvent, all right? So I have been given the volume of the solvent and I do have the density, all right? There are two ways to think about this, right? I know my density formula is density equals to mass per unit volume, right? I can use that formula and figure out the mass or I can just use conversion factor, right? So basically what I mean by that is, so let's say if I have, since I have 300 ml of the solvent, and that solvent has the density of 1.1, ah, something wrong. No, 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 no. Oh, shit. Good. All right. I know that there are 1.13 gram of that solvent in one milliliter of that solvent because I've been given the density, right? Now, when I say it this way, look what happens. The volume milliliter milliliter is canceled. I get my answer in gram, right? But then that's the gram of solvent, right? I have to convert that to kg of solvent. So I'm gonna keep going. I know that there are thousand gram in one kilogram. All right, so when I do that, this gram and gram gets canceled. So in the end, I'm left with kg of solvent. So when I do my math, what I'm going to end up with is zero point three three nine kg. 
All right, that means now I have the number of moles of solute as well as the kg of solvent, right? Then I can use my formula, plug my numbers in this formula, right? So 0 0.3705 mole divided by 0 0.339 kg. And again, something to keep in mind, right? Remember, this mass had only two six feet 12 gram that's why this remember even though i put all four numbers this has two six fix that means this dictates what should be the number of six fix in my final answer right that means my final answer should have only two six fix so when i do my math i'm going to end up with 1.1 moles of solute are in one kg of solvent okay right. so again whenever you do all this math which is grand if you can do the math right but again make sure you are able to explain those answers right in layman's terms so what i mean by that is let's say if i tell you right oh when i was driving on a california highway i was going uh, 80 miles per hour so if i had to explain that to someone in layman's term you'd say something like oh that means on average i my car was traveling 80 miles in one hour right that's what that means whenever someone tells me oh my car is 80 miles per hour right so when someone tells you something like oh the molality was 1.1 so what is that telling you is that there are 1.1 moles of solute that they have dissolved in one kg of solvent. All right, so make sure you are able to explain it that way. And the last one is mole fraction. And I'll get to that mole fraction probably in like two or three slides. All right, because one of these laws does use this concept of mole fraction, and that's why I'll talk about mole fraction then. All right, so this is something i wanted to think about right so i wanted to make sure you at least are able to define these terms right and what do they mean and then calculate that right then if you're given some numbers and mole fraction again i'll get to that mole fraction in a couple of slides but then for molality and molarity you should be able to do that all right and let's see if i ask you if a solution has a molality of five what does that mean and if you have noticed i left this unit on purpose all right, so I go back and it tells me molality is most of solute per kg of solvent. So try to explain that in layman's term. It will tell me that oh, there are five moles of solute that is present in one kg of the solution. All right, now going back to this, I'm going to erase this and I'm going to kind of point this out because. I think this is important. All right. So the important part here, right? Basically, issue with molarity, right? Because I said molarity's formula was number of moles, right? Of the solute that's dissolved there by volume of solution. But then when I used my formula earlier, I used the volume of solvent, right? Now the question is, is that correct? Right? Because my formula tells me volume of solution, whereas how can I use the volume of solvent? Now, if you look at the following sentence, look at that. What it says is the student notices that the volume of the solvent does not change when the solute dissolves in it. And that's why I could assume that the volume of solvent was the same as volume of solution. So I hope that sentence now makes sense. All right, so moving on. Now the next concept. How does the temperature affect the solubility of some salt? All right, so I want you to look at this. All the salts, some of them are, most of them are ionic, right? Some of them are covalent, right? So probably glucose, sucrose is a covalent molecule, meaning that there aren't any ionic species in there, right? So no cations and anions. 
and glucose is a covalent molecule as well. Besides that, all of the other ones are ionic salt, right? Look at that. All of them are ionic compounds. They have the cation and an anion, right? So keep that in mind. Now, if you look at all of the salts, what this graph tells you is, what's the solubility of all these? Salts and sugars. So let us call the sucrose and glucose as sugar, all right? How does the solubility change when you change the temperature, right? So temperature is in the x-axis, solubility of all those salts and sugars are on the y-axis, all right? So in general, except for some of the salt, in general, what you see is, so let's look at ammonium nitrate, right? So this is the graph for ammonium nitrate, NH4NO3. Right. As the temperature increased, as you go across the x-axis, what happens? The solubility generally increases as well, right? Since the solubility is on the y-axis, right? Even if we look at calcium chloride, which is the green graph, same thing, right? So generally, what happens is in salt and sugar, the solubility of the salt and sugar increases as you heat up the solution, right? Not surprising, right? So you might have seen it, right? So let's say if I have a beaker and if I start putting salt in it, and there's going to be a point where the salt will not dissolve. But if I heat the beaker up, guess what? The more salt will dissolve in it. All right. So I hope this makes sense. All right. Now. Let's think about another case. Now, I want you to think about your can Coke, right? Or a bottle of Coke. Have you ever opened that bottle up? And whenever you hear that, open it up, it, you just hear the whoosh sound. What do you think that sound is, right? So that's basically the carbon dioxide that has been released, right? The carbon dioxide, whenever you, the can of Coke is closed, the carbon dioxide is dissolved in the can, right? So whenever you open it, you literally let all those, not all those, some of those dissolve carbon dioxide, which had been dissolved at high pressure, skip out of that can. And that's what the sound comes, right? All right, now this is what we're, we're going to see. How does the temperature affect the solubility of gases? in a solvent, right? So think about that as how does the temperature affect how much carbon dioxide dissolves in a can of Coke? So think about that way, right? So we're gonna look at some of these gases, nitric oxide, oxygen, carbon monoxide, methane, and nitrogen gas. All right, and let's look at that graph. It's the same graph, right? It's the solubility that we have Right, so basically, but the unit, if you have noticed, is like in how much milligram of these substances or this gas have been dissolved in 100 gram of water, right? And the x axis is the temperature in degrees Celsius. So let's focus on, let's say, oxygen gas. So my green one is the oxygen gas. What's the trend that you see? In our earlier slide, we saw that as the temperature increased, the solubility of the salt and sugar increased as well. But here, what is happening here? As the temperature is increasing across the x-axis, look at these values. The solubility of oxygen gas in a solvent is decreasing. And that is holding true for all the gases. All right, so basically the solubility of gas decreases with increasing temperature. But now the question is, isn't it counterintuitive to what we just learned? All right, and here is a good reason as to why that is happening. All right, so let me draw pictorial, pictorial explanation for this. Let's say this is my water. Right, sorry, it's not bigger, so let's just seal it. Let's say this is sealed. And 
my red are all my water molecules. All right. And let's say my green are all my oxygen gas, which are dissolved in this water at a particular temperature, right? And remember, all these gases, right, just have some vapor pressure because some of these oxygen might have, let's say, evaporated off, right? And then it's in the vapor form. But then this oxygen below this red line, they have been dissolved. So that's the red line. Now, remember that's oxygen gas that is dissolved in water. All right. They are interacting with the water molecule. So think about it in this way. So the water molecules are kind of holding them right? from escaping into the vapor phase right here. Right, but when I start heating the solvent, when I start increasing the temperature from let's say 10 to 40 degrees Celsius, what is going to happen? Right, first thing is that oxygen gas that has been dissolved is going to have higher kinetic energy, and that higher kinetic energy will let some of these oxygen atoms, oxygen molecules that were dissolved in water, to escape back into the Phase. And that's why the solubility decreases as the temper temperature increases. And that's why you see this trend. All right. All right. So your knowledge equation. So what I've actually is I've actually referred to the previous slide to to answer this question. The question asks you what is the solubility of carbon monoxide gas? In milligram per 100 gram of water. All right. So, my carbon dioxide gas, I hope you shouldn't have a hard time finding it. All right. And once you find your carbon dioxide gas, sorry, carbon monoxide gas, you're supposed to find its solubility in milligrams per 100 gram of water, which is right here. That's the unit, right? Milligrams per 100 gram of water. At 0, 20, and 4 degrees Celsius. So I'm asking you to figure out the temperature, the solubility at 0 degrees Celsius. Let me do it in orange. 0 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius, and 40 degrees Celsius. All you have to find is the Y value or the solubility of milligram of carbon monoxide in 100 gram of water. All right, so let me give you an example of another one. Right. So let's say if I if I asked you what is the solubility of nitric oxide at zero degrees Celsius, I'm going to go to my nitric oxide, right, which is this graph, and I'm going to my zero degrees Celsius and look at the y value associated with that. Y value associated with that is right here, right, this point. So that's about eight. So this is about nine. So if you have anything from nine point six to nine point nine milligram, right. So this point is roughly. 9.6 to 9.9 .9, right milligrams of NO dissolving in 100 gram of water that's what you have to, got to do with carbon monoxide as gas carbon monoxide as well so that's what so after you get the values for 0 20 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius think about these values, what does it tell you about the general relationship between temperature and the solubility of carbon monoxide? That's something that will help you think about what I just said, and I provided the rationale for All right. So now, Let's look at this Henry's laws and what it means. All right. So, so before that, let's look at the picture, and maybe we can go back to this Henry's law. All right. So if you look at this model, all right. So remember, these are all closed containers, right? In my first figure, 
let's just say same thing, right? So let's say the example of water and oxygen gas. So let's say this is my water solvent that I used, that this person, whoever did the experiment used, right? Water is solvent. And this purple kind of molecules that you see, let's just say those are my oxygen gas that are dissolved. And the one out of the water, right? Those are the oxygen gas, but again, think about those as vapor oxygen gas. Those haven't, have not been dissolved in water. All right. All right, now, when you increase the external pressure, right? So let's say I increase the external pressure, right? By pressing this closed corner down up to this point, so when I do that, what I did was I increased the pressure of the gas, right? Didn't I? Think about that as vapor pressure of the gas, if that helps you. All right? And the reason being, think about that the way we define pressure is pressure equals to force per unit area, right? How much force are these? Oxygen molecules colliding with the container face, right? With the unit area of the container face. So basically, when you press it down and decrease the area, right? And that's why you increase the pressure of the gas. Right? Now, after a while, remember, I haven't moved this closed container where the lead is present. So after a while, to make sure the equilibrium is established, what happens is more oxygen gas will start dissolving. That's why this vapor oxygen gas going back into the water and being dissolved right here. All right. So again, the concept behind this, what I'm trying to tell you is as you increase the partial pressure of this oxygen gas, right, the solubility of the gas increased. And remember, one thing to keep in mind, this is at a constant temperature. I cannot have this at 10 degrees Celsius and have this at 12 degrees Celsius, right? That's not comparing apples and apples to making sure that everything is constant. All of these must be at 10 degrees Celsius. Now, this model is explained by something called Henry's law. All right, so again, the concept behind this is the solubility of gas, right? So the solubility of oxygen gas that I just told you about increases as the partial pressure of the gas, as the partial pressure of the gas of a solution increases. Remember, whenever I talk about, I'm talking about partial pressure of the gas. Think about that as the vapor pressure of the gas that I'm talking about above the solution. All right. Now, this relation can be used to define Henry's law. So basically, solubility of the gas. All right. But then whenever I say solubility of the gas as C, what I'm defining C is as the concentration of dissolved gas at equilibrium. So think about this at equilibrium. I'm talking about the equilibrium system. This is at equilibrium. This is at equilibrium, right? This is not at equilibrium, right? This is just to show that, oh, how I increase the partial pressure of the gas of the solution. So my A and C pictures are in equilibrium, All right? So the solubility of a gas is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas or of the solution. And again, like I told you that C is the way I'm defining the solid gas is basically in the concentration of dissolved gas. How much gas is dissolved? All right, you know, volume of solution. That's how I'm defining. And then to remove the proportionality constant sign, I introduce a constant and this constant is called a K, 
And since Henry was the one who came up with this, we call that Henry's law constant. All right, and not surprisingly, Henry's constant has this unit because you think about this, right? My concentration C has the unit of moles per liter, right? And let's say I'm trying to figure out the unit for K, which I don't know, right? Times the unit of pressure is in ATM. If I rearrange this, what I find is K is going to have the unit of moles per liter times ATM. If I divide both sides by ATM, that's why you have this unit for Henry's law. And again, make sure you keep these units in mind, right? That C that I'm talking about, the solubility of the gas, is phrased in the terms of moles per liter in molarity. How much gas is dissolved at equilibrium, or what is the concentration of the gas that is dissolved in equilibrium is explained by C. And whereas P is the partial pressure of that gas above the solution. All right, so now let's learn how to use the Henry's law and answer some of the Alex equation. All right, so the way Alex asks the equation is, and look at that at a constant temperature, which is really important, right? That's what I've been emphasizing during this picture. That's why I said this has to be at 10 degrees Celsius, this has to be at 10 degrees Celsius, this has to be at 10 degrees Celsius for Henry's law to work. All right, so the Henry's law constant for argon. So basically in this example, they have water, Right, so let's say this is a closed container because remember all of these are supposed to be closed container, and they have some argon gas that we're trying to dissolve in this water. Right, but keep in mind, right, some of this argon gas is going to dissolve in water, but some of them are going to be in the vapor form above the solution. All right, and this is what we are defining as partial pressure. All right. All right. So the green one is argon. And then my orange one is showing me, oh, this is my water. So we're trying to understand how much argon can be dissolved in water if we're given this condition, all right? So let's write down, let's gather information, all the information that I know. All right, so I know that uh, Henry's law constant for argon has been given to me. All right, so that means my K value in my earlier formula, that K has been given to me as 1.4 times 10 to the power minus 3. And again, remember, this molarity is the same as moles per liter, so do not get confused. Right? This is the same as, this unit is the same as molarity per ATM. Right, and my dad is sleeping on my notes because I want to make sure I have done all my math. All right, yes, I did do all my math. All right. All right, so now that has been given to me, it's asking me the mass in grams of argon, right? So basically how much, what's the mass of argon that can be dissolved in water is what's asking me, but they have given me the volume of water. So let me write that down, volume of water. So I'm going to write that down as V of water. It's 1050 milliliter. And to save some time, I'm going to directly convert that to liters, all right? So basically, if you divide that by 1,000, you get your answer in liters. Volume of water is this much liters. And then they have given me the partial pressure of argon. So that means how much, what is the, sorry, what is the partial pressure of argon above the solution? The P value has been given to me, right? So this P value has been given to me. So partial pressure. The value has been given to me as 0 0.63 ATM. All right, so now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write my Henry's law constant formula. C equals to K HP. So anytime you see this K H, it's basically talking about the Henry's law constant, this H. All right, so let me see what I can find. I know my K H, I know my P. That tells me I can find the concentration of argon that's dissolved in water, right? So let's do that. So I have 1.4 times 10 to the power minus three. 
let me just use the word molar per atm times the pressure is in atm 0 0.63 atm so i do my math i'm going to end up with so molarity which is the same as moles per liter all right that's grand right so that means i found the concentration or the how much of argon is dissolved in water so it tells me that 0 0.00082 moles of argon dissolved in liter of water all right but as you see i do not have one liter of water i have 1.050 liter of water so let's figure out how much argon dissolves in the given amount of water right because it does change right let's see if i change the amount of water it changes as to how much argon you can dissolve in it right so to figure that out i'm going to take that 0 0.000882 moles of argon that has been dissolved in liter of water times 1.050 liter of water it tells me how much okay so now what this number tells me is this much mole of water has dissolved in 1.050 liters of water but the question doesn't ask me how many moles of argon gas dissolved in water right it asks me what is the mass of argon that has dissolved in 1.050 liters now all i have to do is convert that moles to mass or grams of that right so what i know is if i go into the Query table, I know that argon is not a diatomic molecule, right? Argon exists as AR. That's why that argon molar mass is atomic mass is 39.94 grams of argon is present in one mole. So I take that number, 0 0.00961 one moles, all right? And then I'm going to use the conversion factor. I know that 39.94 gram of argon is present in one mole of argon. Look at that. When I do that, I can cancel out the mole and mole, and I'm left with grams of argon right so my final answer is going to be 0 0.0369 uh, i don't know why does it do that sometimes okay 0 0.0369 0 gram of argon right but my question is again to how many sig figs should we report the answer to? And look at that. Uh, I think for this, what dictates is this value right here, right? 0 0.63 atm. The faster pressure is has two sig figs. That's why in the end, if you're supposed to report the answer to two sig figs, that's why 0 0.037 gram. That means you can dissolve 0 0.037 gram in. 1050 milliliters of water 0 0.037 gram of argon gas can dissolve in 1050 milliliters of water at 25 degrees celsius all right so i hope this makes sense so i'm going to stop here for the lecture one for wednesday and then lecture two, I'll start in another 10 or 15 minutes, and they all will be uploaded by noon today. All right. So again, I hope this is making sense. I know with lots of practice with Alex problem, trust me, you're gonna get it.
right? Again, remember, repetition is the key. You need to practice. Without practice, you won't even know oh, what does chaos means. And then let's see if I play around with the um, units a little bit here and there, you're going to be in trouble. So make sure you practice lots and lots of problems from Alex. And that's why I have assigned Alex homework. And also remember, your prerequisite review homework on Alex is due tonight. All right. So I will, you'll hear me soon in another video, lecture two.